You are in the Temple of the Rants, where I rant about whatever my $15 a month plus patrons want me to rant about. You can get one of these by becoming one of those. This one's for Bobby, who says to rant about so great and powerful. I'm actually really surprised I haven't done this one already. I kind of felt like I had talked about him somewhere in some capacity, but then I thought about it and I was like, maybe I've only ever done it in passing. But uh, So Great and Powerful was a My Little Pony fan musician who was significantly better than pretty much any of the others. He's the only one who I actually still listen to. I still have his stuff come on in the car, on the reg. Um, and uh, yeah, he was a very mysterious guy. So basically, if you were not a part of the My Little Pony fandom and you don't know anything about it, I'm going to have to prime you a little bit to understand. You see, one of the major components of the Brony fandom um, in terms of content creation was musicians. And most of the music that came out at the time was EDM or dubstep. This was during the height of the dubstep era. Um, or alternatively, rock music that was fairly generic, usually you know, bedroom produced, you weren't exactly going to get high fidelity music. I think part of the reason EDM was more popular is that it's, you know, doesn't necessarily have to sound good instrumentally. Um, but there were lots of artists who were either extremely popular and even went on to greater acclaim like The Living Tombstone, uh, or people who were just sort of, you know, they had a couple, maybe tens of thousands of subscribers on YouTube, you know, they had a few albums, but you could easily have a full-blown career inside of the My Little Pony music circle. You could go to conventions and s do performances, get paid to do shows at conventions, sell your CDs there. Um, so in the scheme of things, So Great and Powerful was a relatively unknown artist. His stuff was not, you know, widely championed. He developed a fervent cult following, both for the fact that his music was a lot more complex and unique than most of the other people doing it, but also just the subject matter that he would tackle in his lyrics or the themes of his music was a lot more interesting. He talked a lot about philosophy and, uh, you know, greater social constructs. He would literally be like name dropping philosophers and shit in his writing, you know, lyrics like, what did Hegel mean by absolute spirit? And then you as a listener, meaning me, goes and looks up Hegel and reads absolute spirit and goes, I can't even parse this, much less understand what Hegel meant by this. But, uh, you know, it's, it's stuff like that. So, um, his early stuff was in, in, the reason he was doing My Little Pony music in particular is he was inspired by another musician named Pinkie Pie Swear who did this sort of um, atmospheric, like, uh, not ambient, it was like a, a sort of trancey music. It was, you know, electronic, but with um, with a much more subdued, light-hearted kind of feel to it. Um, you know, Pinkie Pie Swear was a little bit bigger. Um, he started by remixing one of that guy's songs, and he made these these uh, initially six tracks, each one for each of the main characters of the show, and then a track that sort of compiled uh, elements of all the other ones into one harmonious track. And his songs were built out of samples from the show, but chopped up, you know, like he might take little vocal snippets of the characters singing or speaking and create these very vibrant, melodious songs that would have explosive, complicated, um, you know, melodic passages. They were always, like, evolving. They, they were not by any means a conventionally structured song. They were more like uh, post-rock music or something, you know. Um, they had chapters, in a way, across a single track. I would highly recommend, for instance, the song A Beautiful Heart, um, which is the rarity-focused song, probably my favorite, that or the Applejack one, which I think was called On My Own. Um, check those out. He would also do something where he would often sample other creators' stuff in his work and then, you know, use that to to make, to, to be like the theming of, for instance, the, the Rainbow Dash one was based around a pony piano where somebody had just made this incredible piano piece and he took that and reworked it into a, a fuller song. So that whole part was referred to as the Elements of Brony era. Um, he had released all these songs pretty much once every couple of months. Nothing else was really known about him. Most people in this fan base had a Twitter. They had people they knew, that interacted with. They were, you know, around. This guy, not so much. Um, 
And of course, there were lots of people who wanted to get into t- to contact with them. I think the main people who had succeeded in doing so were Saber Spark and Paleo Steno, who had this uh, this brony radio show where they would bring on, um, you know, just bring on anybody who had made something they thought was cool and talk to them. They had met him at conventions and stuff, and he was very, very down on his own work. So even though everybody else loved his stuff and he had like a fervent cult following, he would remove it regularly so he you know after the, that whole era was over he just pulled all that music off of uh, off his channel and then in the interim he had made these three songs that were uh, more vocal driven and at one point he also put together a medley of destroyer covers so if you're familiar with the musician destroyer um, I had not been, and when I heard this series of covers and then found out about the musician, I realized this was where this sound was coming from, because I had never heard anything that sounded like So Great and Powerful, and there's not much that really sounds like it, but if you listen to Destroyer, you'll be like, okay, I, I get how this is the inspiration behind this, but um, he put out three songs that were more in that vein, uh, one called Indelible Ink, which is probably my favorite um, lyrically and structurally uh, a sorceress girl and another track I don't remember but um, these were all great songs and I personally loved his vocals I loved his lyrics so that kind of took it to another level for me now for a lot of people they kind of just stuck with that early stuff because it was more driven by sound bites from the show people were less interested in you know him as a musician than they were in hearing the pony voices being turned into music essentially um, so when he came back, he never quite got as m- even as many views on his stuff as he had on that early shit. Not that he was gunning for that at all. I mean, he gen- genuinely seemed to not like most of what he was doing and to just be doing it for fun and for experimentation, but without really, uh, you know, wanting to be seen as a musician or anything like that. Definitely didn't want to be in the spotlight. Um, but then he started putting out songs for uh, episodes of season two. It was called the S2 era. So I think he made six, maybe even eight tracks that were based on individual episodes of the show that were really interesting, even more experimental, started combining the vocal with the, you know, the pony element. Um, He also did one track that I would describe as just like a free jazz experiment uh, what the hell was it called? It was one that was like, another one based on vocal samples from the show, but it was it was like listening to the improv part in a King Crimson song or something, you know? It was, like, very out there, and it didn't get as strong of a reception as some of his other stuff. But the S2 stuff was pretty great. Then he did a three-part song called Space Pony that was, when put together, one nine-minute track that is probably my... probably the best one, in my opinion. I mean, I love when that shit comes on in the car. It, it goes to a lot of movements, um... It's it's a phenomenal song about space, and it sounds like space. And finally, he was going to do a series of songs called Unmakeable Love, where he was going to ship different uncommon pairings of the main characters and make songs about them, you know, if they were a relationship, sort of. He only did the Rainbow Dash rarity one and then disappeared. And he hasn't apparently made any music since. However... There was such a fervent following of him by the time that he left that people made a website, I think it's called just so great and powerful dot com, that catalogs all of his music, because there's no way to find it. Um, you know, he's deleted it all. So you can find it all for download and listen on this website. Um, it's even got like random snippets that he had posted on his Tumblr and stuff, or uh, you know, he also did a few collaborations. He did one with Sherclop Pones, who was famous for the Friendship is Witchcraft series and a bunch of songs from that. They did a song called 40 Winks Together, which I did a collaboration with an artist called Rain Snow Hail, in which we took that and made it into a rap song that I did, um, 40 Winks in Baltimore. I also did a tribute song to him with a guy called Cherax Destructor, who's also a really good musician from the, uh, the Brony community who did uh, electronic music. He's still around, just, uh, you know, doing, like, post-rock, not related to Pony. Um, And he made this track that I rapped another guy's poem about So Great and Powerful over called uh, For Null From Idelia With Love or something like that. Um, So, yeah, I've done a few tributes to him. I talked to him a couple times on Skype, but, again, he was a pretty elusive guy. Um, I heard some 
weird rumors about him from some of the people who knew him. Uh, you know, like, he was just super reclusive and nobody really knew what his deal was. And it seemed like he didn't want to be in the spotlight. So I'm not surprised, you know, as somebody who's lived in the spotlight, I understand totally why someone would want to keep their privacy and why you, you know, wouldn't want to have people constantly looking to you, um, you know, it's like, hey, just you guys can have my music. He's never asked anybody to take it down or anything, you know. He he just seems to not want to be connected to it in a direct way. But yeah, I I still like his shit. I still listen to pretty much all of it in my car. I don't think he ever put out a bad song. Some of them um, are so unconventional that they might be, you know, difficult to even, like, get into at first. But I think that, given time, I've come to love every song he's ever put out. So, yeah, um... Good shit, worth, worth checking out.